From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. This is the vehicle you probably think of when you think of a paramedic. I'm Chell Lehman. Coming up, I'm going to show you that paramedics are much more than that. Best Practice Medicine in Bozeman is sending paramedics all over the country, and they're working in other places besides just an ambulance. Finding a COVID test or getting a mask has been easy for quite some time in this country, but could Washington in action soon change that? We go inside the debate over COVID funding next. 631 on this final Monday of March. Chill Lehman Matt Elwell with you here. We had a lovely oh. spring weekend, a lovely start to our work day out there right now. Oh, so it's unbelievably warm. Um, it is. Just walking outside, you're wondering what time of year it is. But my coat is in the car. It never came inside. I had I, to make sure I had mine in the car yep. because uh, yeah, I, I had it on. I didn't think about it. I put it on and then took it off by the time I yep. got out of the car. So. And it's beautiful. Most yeah. areas into the 40s this morning, 32 out toward West Yellowstone, 31 according to Ken, our weather watcher uh, in West. Today's going to be very odd. <laughs> We're going to see the cloud cover, <laughs> warm temperatures, uh, the potential of a thunder shower. We have a lot of moisture in the middle part of the atmosphere, and there could be some gusty winds uh, and some small to moderate hail with a couple of those showers and thunderstorms late this afternoon. That's very spring-like, and along in those same vein, that same vein, we'll probably have some snow in the area tomorrow with temperatures dropping. Today we're looking at highs into the 60s, windy conditions, and late day showers. We'll talk about how that's going to affect tomorrow. That's coming up in just a few minutes. All right, thank you, Matt. 632, our top story this half hour. They say for a business to succeed, it must change as the world changes. Best Practice Medicine in Bozeman has done just that several times since its founding back in 2015. As we recently found out, the pandemic was a business killer for many, but for best practice, it was just a way to pivot to new opportunities. Best Practice Medicine's founders found challenges for rural communities attracting paramedics and EMTs. That was seven years ago. Classroom and practical training for those medical professionals quickly morphed into a training paramedics for fire crews. Then along came COVID-19 and FEMA's need to inoculate lots of people. Made that pivot with our, with our wildland fire teams that supported FEMA to su now we're supporting uh, big healthcare systems. Today, uh, we're supporting seven, seven hospitals in Montana and um, an additional eight states. Now, what do paramedics have to do with hospital medical care? Well, another pivot for BPM. Yesterday I looked, there was over 117,000 open travel nursing positions in the country. Um, so even if you, were, if you were a hospital system and you were trying to staff, uh, uh, you, you had critical staffing needs, it's unlikely that you would even be able to source a nurse. And so why not look outside the box and, and come up with a, an alternative solution and, and putting a paramedic into a, a, a hospital clinical setting at full scope it is one of those paradigm shifts uh, of, of supporting a hospital system. Make no mistake, paramedics are still needed. So now, best practice medicine has developed a traveling paramedic program. Some recently returned from Bakersfield, California. That was a very high acuity um, setting down there. They were a, a high crime metro service. Um, and the frequency down there it was a very high call volume with a lot of different um, calls that you you know, experience that we wouldn't necessarily get in uh, Bozeman or other places in Montana for that matter. That certainly helped Bakersfield, but it also benefits best practice medicine. Yeah, it's truly, it's a blessing. Um, I think the opportunity to go from state to state, even stay within Montana and work, meet new people, work with different partners, and then work in different systems is a really unique opportunity because I get to learn more. Not everyone can spend time here in Bozeman, so best practice has now taken its training to the rest of the country, thanks to this high-tech classroom and a little creativity. Now, best practice medicine's classrooms are not just inside. In fact, what you're looking at behind this door is a classroom as well, fully mobile. In fact, it has the ability to simulate virtually any training scenario that you would need to be a quality paramedic. It's leaving in just a little bit to take off to Kansas to do work for the Department of Defense. Six medical rooms, fully automated, using state-of-the-art simulation. Now training is real, without the real cost of life. The simulation trailer is kind of the same thing. To watch a student 
start doing one thing but then end doing another thing and, and being more confident is it's really cool. Again, the pandemic cut training opportunities. This mobile classroom fills that void. With the height of COVID um, and the um, advent of less clinical opportunities because of COVID, um, this has been a real, a real game changer for people, especially in the clinical setting um, for continuing education and also initial education at um, you know, universities and training centers like Best Practice. So what started as a training facility for paramedics in rural Montana has now turned into a state-of-the-art medical training campus with mobile branch locations. Seems appropriate, it's based in a building most in the Gallatin Valley know as the life of Montana. In Bozeman, Chet Lehman, MTN News. Now, right now, several people in Big Timber are taking paramedic training from best practice medicine thanks to modern technology. Other news this morning, we're learning more about a hiker who was found dead in Park County after an apparent grizzly bear attack last week. Tian's Mitch Loggy tells us the father of four had been doing this for years without issue. Now the family is without their rock. The community in Livingston is still trying to process its loss. Two days after hiker Craig Cluter went into these mountains near Six Mile Creek, about 30 miles south of town, and was attacked and killed by a grizzly bear. It's kind of hard to imagine it. Uh, yet. I don't think for most of us it feels very real. It's more like a long weekend and we haven't seen him yet. Bev Dawson is family friends with the Cluters and is a regular hiking partner with Craig's wife Jamie, who is now responsible for raising the family's four kids, ranging in age from 14 to 9. Other than being an avid outdoorsman who's hiked hundreds of backcountry miles, Dawson said Cluter was a force of positivity throughout the region, delivering food to restaurants from Cook City to Wilsall and all over Livingston for Cisco. His trademark would be his smile and the way he brought light to people. Um, always positive, even when things are in the dumps for him, he boosted the folks around him and that's a huge thing to do without. This isn't the first time the Cluter family has dealt with tragedy. The community rallied around the family in January 2020 when their Livingston home was demolished in a fire. They just moved into a new place about nine months ago. It's really important that people remember them. Jamie's on her own now with these kids and she's going to need a lot of help for a long time coming. A GoFundMe account has been set up to benefit the Cluters, along with an account at American Bank in Livingston. Links to donate can be found in this story on our website. And while the pain from the loss is still raw, Dawson said she hopes other people won't be afraid to spend time outdoors. All of my people and Craig's people are outdoor people. We're going to continue to be out in the wilderness. It, it fuels us, it feeds us, it's like air and you have to breathe it. I'm sure we're all going to be extra loud in the woods and maybe we'll curtail the places we go or going alone, but I, I know it's not going to stop anybody I know from heading out. In Livingston, Mitch Laggy, MTN News. 639 now in other news, we are entering week four of a stalemate over COVID funding. Biden administration for weeks has wanted more than $20 billion to help with the next phase of the pandemic to keep up the buying of tests and vaccines. Congress so far has rejected that idea. So where do we go from here? What is the consequence of ending taxpayer funded programs? Our Joe St. George breaks it down. How's your COVID supply doing? Personally, I'm down to a few tests, a few masks. For months when I ran low, I would just go to the store or rely on the government to send me a new test or a new mask. But there are emerging questions about how long the federal government's COVID supply will actually last, with the White House saying not very long. If Congress presides the funds we need, we'll have new stockpiles of tests, masks, pills ready if needed. But Congress is not providing them. those funds, at least not right now. You see, after a State of the Union address, the president asked Congress for over $22 billion to fund more testing and more vaccine distribution. That was rejected. Speaker Nancy Pelosi thought she negotiated a $15 billion COVID funding compromise, but that was rejected too. Now there are questions, can a deal ever come together? In order for new COVID funding to happen, 10 Republicans will have to join 50 Democrats in the Senate. However, the politics of COVID right now remains extremely partisan, especially with the midterms approaching. Republicans are arguing Congress has spent a lot of money already and that some of that should be redirected and better accounted for. 
Some Republicans have even said the president has sufficient supplies. Democrats are arguing previously allocated funds are not enough and they should not be reallocated. So what has been cut and what will be cut because of the inaction? According to the White House, on March 22nd, uninsured Americans stopped getting tests and treatment reimbursed. On March 25th, the government scaled down an order of antibody treatments and rations supplies to states. On April 5th, uninsured Americans will stop getting vaccines reimbursed on May 3rd. 30th, the U.S. will stop helping companies mass produce COVID tests and will stop sending antiviral treatments to states. A lack of funding has immediately impacted vaccines, with the U.S. scaling back an effort to send vaccines to other countries that have low vaccination rates. The White House says the U.S. will not have enough additional boosters or variant specific vaccines if needed for all Americans. Some medical experts say another booster will be needed later this year. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. 641. Speaking of that, there are new COVID booster shot recommendations for seniors. That's just ahead after the break, along with a home warranty warning. I'm John Matteries. Home warranties are supposed to give you peace of mind when a major appliance fails. But then why do so many people say it denied their claim? But you need to know about these warranties coming up.